thing that I'm saying here is my own or original. But I do think that I can put together some people's writings who have witnessed to what's going on in various different ways. And perhaps for the sake of a you know, half an hour talk, uh, I could put something only to help you as a kind of guideline to see if you think that this is so. And I'll tell you the names of some of those people. First of all, they're my own teachers. Professor Verovskoy, Father Schmemann, Father Meindorf, Dr. Arseniev primarily. Zizi Ulis I had as a teacher once. Uh, also, um, writers like uh, Thomas Merton. Uh, artists like Flannery O'Connor, who was introduced to me more than 25 years ago by uh, Father Paul Yerger. He gave it to, a book of Flannery O'Connor to me as a gift. I've never been the same since. <laughs> We spent two months together when Father was coming into the Orthodox Church. He came to uh, our uh, house to live. And when he left, he gave me a book of Flannery and wrote inside the cover, In Pursuit of Wisdom. Because <laughs> uh, Flannery, well, she has these incredible stories, a southern writer. But there's other writers. Solzhenitsyn would be here tonight. Dostoevsky would be here tonight. Uh, but more than anyone uh, would be in another way in the spiritual world would be the arena of Branchaninov would be here tonight. Um, but perhaps more than anyone else would be C.S. Lewis in the book The Abolition of Man. And the writings of a rather unknown person, but I think he's one of the geniuses of the end of the 20th century. His name is Carl Stern. He was a secular Jew neuroscientist who survived Hitler because of an American fellowship. He was a total Renaissance genius man, uh, and he went through uh, from, from atheism through prophetic type of fiery Judaism, and then ultimately became a Christian, a Catholic. But he was actually converted through the Russian writers. <laughs> And he has three books that I, if I could order people to read, I'd ask them to read them. One is his spiritual autobiography called The Pillar of Fire. Another one is a critique of Western culture called The Flight from Woman. Strange title, but it's a great book. And another one is called The Third Revolution. And it had to do with psychoanalysis and the modern culture. But primarily... Uh, what I will share with you from Stern, which is very similar to Solzhenitsyn, and very similar to the abolition of man by Lewis, and very similar to many others, uh, is a letter that he wrote to his brother, who was on a kibbutz in Israel, a Zionist, which is still quite relevant if you look at CNN and read that newspaper they stick under your door free of charge every morning over at the hotel if you could handle it. <laughs> um, but C.S. Lewis in 1944 and Carl Stern in 1951 predicted everything that's, gonna hap that's happening right now. Unbelievably, in my opinion. And so did others in other ways. Like Solzhenitsyn. Like Flannery O'Connor here in America. And basically, um, I'm just going to tell you what their prediction was. And then I hope just to say a couple of things about if it is right, what do we do? Shlodjelet. What do we do? What to do? Um, in doing this, <laughs> um, I don't want to blame them for anything I say, okay? So read them yourself. <laughs> but this is, the, this is what I got from it. In his sermon this morning, <clears throat> Father Paul um, used the uh, expression postmodern. Postmodern. And in the jargon, you know, there's always jargon, right? The jargon of the time... In, in the Western world, the thinkers like to speak about where we are now in a period of postmodernism. And it's sometimes hard to get a handle on what that will actually mean, and it probably means different things to different people. But it also uh, begs the issue of what was modernism, <laughs> if it's postmodernism. 
And certainly if it's a postmodern, then we would have to say that it is post-Christian as a culture. But I will argue tonight, according to these sources, that it is worse even than post-Christian. It's post-human. Post-human. <laughs> and so what, what is it that's claimed? In 1944, C.S. Lewis was reading a grammar book of teaching grammar in the British schools. And he said that when he started reading this grammar book, he discovered the book was not about grammar. It was presenting in a subliminal, insidious way, if that's the right word there, help me, Vladik, if it's not, you know, secretly destructive and you're not even aware of it, a poison into the life of those students who were reading that grammar book. And he said, and if this, if what is taught in this book becomes part of the system of people and they grow up, it will be the abolition of man. He said, humanity as we know it will no longer exist. And my thesis is that it happened. <laughs> it happened. <laughs> It's a very tough book. It's very slim. I thought I brought it up, but I brought another one by mistake. It's in my bag over there, wherever it is. I can get it. This is not a bad one either, speaking the truth in love. But, um, <laughs> but it's a very thin book. It's in there? Oh, goodness. I didn't bring it. Sorry. I thought it, I, I took it wrong from, from home. Oh, no, it's right under my paper. There it is. <laughs> See how thin it is? <laughs> it's a tough book. I've read this eight times in the last by three months and I still don't get the middle part. <laughs> but I got enough of it to give a talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> and what he says is a very simple thing. And, 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 and he does it a lot better than I'm going to do now, so forgive me. You know. But what he says basically is this. They're teaching grammar. And they're teaching about how to describe a huge, magnificent waterfall, cataract, a waterfall, majestic waterfall. And then these authors of this book are saying, well, someone said, what do you think of that? He says, oh, it's kind of pretty. Another one says, gee, it's nice. And then another one says, it's sublime. It's sublime. And then they start saying, you know, what is the right word for the waterfall? And then he said, well, pretty, nice, this, that. Then they get into words worth this, that. I don't know why. It gets kind of complicated at that point. But then what they say is certainly this majestic waterfall can be described as sublime. But then the authors of the book go on to say, however, of course, they're not saying anything about the waterfall at all. What they're really saying is, when I look at the waterfall, I have sublime feelings. C.S. Lewis at that point says, they don't know the English language. You can't have sublime feelings. You could look at the waterfall, think it's sublime, and then feel humbled or, or uh, touched or overwhelmed. But you can't have sublime feelings, so they don't even know how to use the language. He said, but what they're trying to say is, there isn't anything in that waterfall. All they are, quote-unquote, merely speaking about is what they feel about it when they see it. And so there isn't any objective reaction that a human being should have when they see this majestic waterfall. All they do is utter in one way or another what they feel about it subjectively, and it is merely thrown in there, so it has a kind of debunking character to it. It doesn't really matter what you're saying anyway, because all you're saying is what you subjectively feel, and the other person next to you could feel something different anyway, and the waterfall does not demand and elicit any proper reaction from you when you observe it. He said... If that ever wins, it's the end of humanity. Why? He said, because there's a faculty inside a human 
that he in the book calls the Tao, the Tao. And he did it, I think, on purpose because he says, this book is not about Christianity. I'm known as a Christian speaker. This has nothing to do with Christianity. This has to do with the philosophy that's behind this grammar book. And he said that in every culture of humanity up until his 1944 period, every culture was founded on a conviction that there is a faculty that is in human beings that is the faculty that makes them human. (laughs) And that faculty is not their brain, it's not their reasoning power, and it is not their sense experience. It's a deeper reality that is meant to organize, order, develop, cultivate, refine the thinking process and how to handle the sense experiences that you have. In fact, it's that faculty that provides the axioms for thinking. That's where you get the the first things, to use Aristotle language. That's where you get the basic realities. And he said, different cultures called it different things. He said, some cultures called it the image of God in a person. Some cultures, like the Bible, called it the heart. The heart. You see? Sometimes in biblical language it was called... In Romans 2, the law imprinted on the heart. The so-called natural law. Uh, in, 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 uh, in Greek philosophy, it was called logos. Uh, in, in Asian, it was called the Tao. But it was this intuitive faculty which makes a human human. Because without it, without it, the brain would just be like a machine. And the senses would be nothing but sensations and experiences. And he says, we are not machines. We are not angels. We're not animals. We're not plants or or rocks. We're humans. We're humans. And I believe that in our tradition, that particular faculty would be called the heart. But in some patristic authors, it's called the noose. The inner intuitive faculty that Plato even saw in his uh, famous uh, Republic uh, provides the insights into the realities upon which then you can argue. But you can't even have a meaningful argument unless you are, are having certain basic insights that you can share and agree are good, true, beautiful, or at least demanding admiration, demanding honor, demanding obedience, you know, that there is truth that there is beauty, that there is good, then you could argue about what it is or what it isn't. But that, but that intuition that that is there, that's the foundational reality. And he said, if you destroy that, you don't have human beings anymore. And then he said, and if what is taught in these grammar books catches on... It will be the abolition of man. And so the first lecture in the book is called Men Without Chests. Because he he located that faculty here. Not here. Not down there somewhere. But here. You see? And that that is that unique, unique faculty. But then he went on to say... And I don't want to spend too much time on what he went on to say, but although it's very important, but what he went on to say was, if that is abolished, then we're nothing but a brain and a body. And uh, I've been using this uh, in some of my sermons and talks lately, and I went a little bit further, because I don't think he saw the cybernetic age. He didn't see where we are now. He certainly didn't see it in 1944. But I think that what what we could say in our North American society now, you're not only uh, um, a brain and a body. And by the way, one providential thing was when I was reading this book, I think for the fifth time, uh, I saw saw a uh, a, a piece in the newspaper that I actually cut out and kept. It was about an artistic production in England which was called A Festival of Brains and Bodies. (laughs) Um, Talk about prophecy. Um, But 